2 Peter chapter 1. You know, Peter the apostle only wrote two epistles, but they're so full of revelation, knowledge, and understanding. And what he says is very profound. Now, Sunday I, speak, I spoke a message about Jesus living inside of us. And as I began to meditate upon the reality of Christ in us, I began to look at the reality, the fact of who I am in Christ. And uh, I found a hundred declarations of who I am in Christ. I'd like to speak on that, but I'm not going to do that tonight because really for us to understand who we are in Christ, we need to understand Christ. We need to understand Jesus. We need to see Jesus. And that's really why we have the whole Bible. The Bible is a revelation of who Jesus is. Uh, it, it's a progressive revelation from the old to the new. And as you look at these words of the disciples and the apostles, you come to understand that they had, this was not natural knowledge, this is revelation knowledge. Uh, this is divine inspiration. This is the Holy Spirit pulling back the veil and revealing to us who Jesus really is. And, and Peter said something that's really amazing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, verse 2. He says, grace and peace. Of course, we could back up to verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, notice, of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he says this in verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through how? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, in the modern day church, when people speak about grace, it's the word charis, they will try to tell you that charis means God's divine favor, or the word grace means God's divine favor. And for the life of me, I do not understand where they got that interpretation. Because the Greek word for grace is charis. It's the exact same Greek word that we get for charisma, which is the description of all the supernatural gifts of the Holy Ghost, what we call the power gifts, revelation gifts, and utterance gifts. And so, you know, when we talk about the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, the gift of faith, miracles, healings, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, uh, diversity of tongues, these all come from chariz or charisma or it's the divine enablement of God. That's what grace is. And when it says we're saved by grace, that means we're saved by the divine ability of God. And what is that ability? That is the ability to do whatever God's called us to do, to walk in the supernatural, the miraculous, uh, to do the impossible. So people would like to imply, well, I'm saved by grace. Yeah, by the divine ability of God to do what you could never do in the flesh. And I've experienced that for 49 years. Before I got born again, I was an utter, complete mess, a flop, a failure. I mean, there was nothing I was good at, period. And when I got born again in the grace of God, through the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord and through the knowledge of God, grace began to come upon me and I found myself doing things that I never dreamed of doing uh, before I got saved. Uh, you know, for instance, even speaking, I, I couldn't even talk. I had a speech impediment, and I know I've preached well over 10,000 sermons. I, I've written over 7,000 sermon outlines up to this point. Uh, I think Amazon's telling me altogether that I have written over like 370 books. Um, I could never do these things in myself, you know, built this facility back in 1986, started a church in Hagerstown, it's still there, has a beautiful building, uh, started 25 churches in the Philippines. I'm not bragging about Mike Yeager, I'm saying by the grace of God, by the divine ability of God, by the divine enablement of God, I've done these things. And that's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So grace is not a license to commit sin. It's the opposite. Grace is the divine ability of God to where we can do. We can do whatever God has called us to do. Uh, we are whoever God has said we are. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so it's Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So let's go back and see what Peter said. Peter said, grace and peace. Grace and peace, you know, the kingdom of God is what? Uh, it's it's, it's uh, 
peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost. It's, the, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. That means that's what's working inside of you. It's got at work inside of you. So when you're in the will of God, you will experience, you will be living right, and you will have peace, and you will have joy. And it says grace and peace is going to be multiplied. Notice it's not going to be added. It's going to be multiplied unto you. How? Through the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. You know, Paul said in Philippians, he said that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his suffering. And so there's this reality of knowing God. Uh, that's got to be the cry of our heart. God, I want to know you. And there's no end to who God really is. Uh, matter of fact, I wrote a book. It's in the back there. And I went from A to Z. I began to think about, okay, who, who really is Jesus? And I'm going to share some of those thoughts with you tonight. But who really is Jesus from A to Z? And I began to, uh, like, for instance, he's the Alpha, Alpha and the Omega. He's the Almighty God. He's, uh, he, he's alive forevermore. And so I just began to go from A to Z. And when I got done, it took me a matter of months. And I was just letting my imagination run wild who God is. None of it's exaggeratory because really that book come, doesn't even come close to who God is. But that book has 1,200 declarations of who Jesus is. 1,200. 1,200. Uh, I began to memorize them at one time. I think I got up to uh, maybe uh, the letter uh, E or F. I be just began to memorize them just for myself, for I could meditate on who Jesus really is. But it says grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Huh? So this divine ability of God increases in our lives as we attain knowledge. Now, we're not talking about a head knowledge. We're talking about a heart knowledge. And really, uh, that's what faith is. Faith is when you know. Uh, for instance, I think most born-again believer would, would, could absolutely declare boldly and loudly, I'm born again. I know Jesus lives in my heart. I, I, I know that Jesus died for me. I know that he rose again from the dead. And them are very profound, but you have, you have that knowledge in your heart. You have that revelation, because that's what faith is. Faith is revelation. Uh, I know Smith Wigglesworth used to say that faith is Jesus manifested in your flesh. And that's true. It's Christ manifested in our flesh. That's what faith is. Uh, because God, he, he is faith. I mean, God is love, but God is faith. He can't deny himself. If we don't believe, he cannot deny himself. And God believes in himself. He does. And the Father believed in the Son. The Son believed in the Father. And the Holy Spirit believed in the Father and the Son. And we don't believe in ourselves, but we believe in the Christ who lives in our heart. And that's where he lives. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we really got into that Sunday morning and Sunday night. But according as his divine power, listen, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge, hear it again, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So let me read that again. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. And that's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? How? How does he give these things? Through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue. God's calling us into the glory. And, and we understand the, 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 the word glory would pertain to the manifested presence of God. God manifesting himself, you know, in the old covenant, when the glory of the Lord would come upon the tabernacle as a fire by night and a cloud by day, that was God's tangible presence and touchable, you know, seeable, smellable presence. And, and so it says here that through the knowledge of him that is calling us into that tangible essence of who God really is, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is the world through lust. So what it's talking about here 
is through the great promises of God. This is the promises from, from Genesis to Revelation, that by these promises that God has given to us, his covenant, we, we call it the New Testament, the new covenant, by the covenant that God has given to us, by these promises, we become partakers of who God is. You know, the promise of healing, the promise of provision, the promise of blessing, the promise of, uh, of him leading and guiding, uh, the promise that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, the promise that if we call on to him, he will answer us. Uh, these are promises. You know, in our society today, where promises are made and never kept by the leaders of our nations, no one trusts them. You know, if you take a look at the stats today, nobody, nobody really trusts those in the media, those who are in government, those who are in positions of authority. Um, even if you look at the stats of people who are the least trusted, uh, it is car salesmen. It is, uh, believe it or not, it, 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 is, it is preachers. People don't trust preachers. Uh, they don't trust lawyers. You'd, you'd have to be nuts to trust a lawyer. You know what I'm saying? So why? Because they're promise breakers. They're covenant breakers. They don't keep their words. And so we have such a lack of trust in just humanity, and that has filtered over into the fact of people not trusting this book. But see, as a Christian, my life is supposed to be built upon the foundation of this book. And, um, you know, God will fail us, but I mean, God won't fail us. Man will fail us, but God will never fail us. God will never fail us. He said, he, he, he said it's impossible for him to fail us. The covenant, the promises, the blessings, the provisions he's given to us, they, they, they are ours. And over and over, the Bible says that we've got to live, we've got to walk, we've got to move by faith. Uh, I, I think it's uh, three times in the New Testament it says the just shall live by faith, and one time it says the just shall walk by faith. And, 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 and we know Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it's, it's an, an intangible world. You can't see it with your physical eyes, but you know it in your heart. You, you know, like right now, we know there's angels in this room. We know. We know. I know there's angels here. Can't see them, can't feel them, can't smell them. Uh, don't really want to talk to them. People talk to angels. I don't talk to angels. I talk to Jesus. I talk to the Father and I talk to the Holy Spirit, but I don't talk to angels. But they're, they're hearing me. And the Bible says angels were created to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. And when we get to heaven, we're going to find out how many times those angels were there to rescue us. And so it's an amazing reality. But but people who who don't have faith, they 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 see. I can see the angelic world by faith. I see it by faith. I see the promises of God are mine by faith. I see it through the eyes of faith. I see God is who he says he is. He has what he says he has, and he does what he says he'll do. I see it by faith. But see, if you don't have eyes of faith, that means you're blind and you, you can't see it. And so when we talk about the reality of faith, uh, whether it be healings or miracles or whatever God's word says, those who have no faith, they're going to mock us. Um, they're going to look down at us. You know, it kind of reminds me of Elijah. When uh, Gehazi was, uh, you know, full of fear because they said, we're surrounded, we're surrounded. And Elijah says, no, 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 no. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And, uh, uh, you know, Gehazi looked at Elijah and in his heart he probably said, well, now he's lost his mind. <laughs> you know, because he's counting one, two, and look at the hundreds or the thousands. And so Elijah said, okay, you got a problem. You can't see what I see because you're not in the spirit. Uh, and, and see, being in the spirit is walking by faith. And so when David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Uh, all the other Israelites, they saw a giant of a killing machine. David didn't see a killing machine. He saw an uncircumcised man who had no covenant with God, who was defying God and the armies of God. And he said, let me at that rascal. And uh, everybody thought he was nuts, everybody. But he was in another realm. And so they finally said, yeah, you go ahead, kid. You do what you can. And what did he do? He defeated Goliath lickety-slick. Why? Because he was walking in that realm of faith. 
So when you're in the realm of faith, you laugh at sickness, you laugh at disease, you laugh at the opposition, you laugh at it. You, you go, <laughs> who are you compared to my God? I mean, if God before you, who can be against you? When you're in faith, you laugh. At, I can't tell you how many times when the enemy attacked me, and, and by faith, I laughed at him. I laughed at the lie of the devil. Uh, I mean, I've been in this church. It's going to be going on 43 years. And many times it looked like we were gone uh, for financial reasons. And, and I would laugh at him. I'd say, you're a liar. I'm not gone. God put this church here. I don't have to beg. I don't have to plead. I don't have to worry. Uh, I don't have to lose any sleep. God's going to supply my needs. And I'm not going to have to manipulate and connive and try to figure a way to get the money in. I'm going to do this thing by faith. And so that's how, because of how I know who God is. I know, I know Jesus as my healer. I know God as my provider, my protector, my helper, my wisdom. He's my righteousness. He's, he's, my, he's the author and finisher of my faith. And so through grace and peace is this knowledge multiplied. But look over here in Matthew. Uh, we can't get into this to a great extent tonight, but we can definitely dip our feet into this revelation. And Jesus, he, he came not just to die for us, to pay for our sins, to take our sins and to rise again and, and, and to get us born again. But he came to reveal the father to humanity. He came to reveal who God is to all of the human race. Of course, he, he was God, and he took on a form of a servant. That's why it says in Philippians, Let this mind be in you who is also in Christ Jesus, who being in a form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal, equal with God. He was equal, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. For for God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. It says he overcame principalities and powers. It says that he has power over uh, all the realms, the heavenly, the earthly, and the under the earth. He, he's got power. He's got all the power. And I'm in him and he's in me. And it all works by faith. See, it's, all, it, it, it's not feelings, it's not emotions. You know, when, when I used to be a pilot, I had what they call visible flight flying license. That means as long as it was not storm, now I could fly at night, but I couldn't fly in, 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 in bad weather where there was heavy clouds or a snowstorm, or anything like that. It was visible flight rules. And that means as long as my eyes could look and I could see, I, I was legal to fly. But when the bad weather flew in, I had to get my plane out of the sky and land because I wasn't trained for it. Now, wait, 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 now if you're trained to fly uh, with, with, without your sight, it, it is literally a license, and what they do is they, they train you, they put a mask on you, and with, with, with kind of like a visor, and so you can't see outside of your plane. All you can do is you can see the instruments. Now listen, so when, when, you're, when you're trained to uh, fly by instruments, not, nothing else, you can't go by your feelings, because and even though uh, I wasn't, I didn't have my license to fly uh, instruments. They still had to teach you some because the day might come when you're caught in a storm. So they take you up, right? And they put this hood over you. And they, the, the guy, because, you know, in that plane there's two yokes, uh, a Cessna 150. And they, they, the guy will go into a steep dive. He'll go into a steep climb. He'll, and he'll say to you, okay, now take me, uh, bring it down flat level flying. So you got to look on your instruments and you got to find out according to the instruments. And what's so strange is you're diving, but you think you're climbing. You're climbing, but you're diving. You're going to the left, but you think because your, your five senses just go haywire. When you can't use your eyes, your five senses are haywire, and you've got to use nothing but those instruments in order to bring you where you need to be. For in words, you can't go by how you feel. Well, I feel like I'm, but there's been many a man who died because they thought they were climbing and they were diving. It doesn't make sense, does it? 
And then there's people who have died because they, they thought they were going flat and level, but they were climbing into where their plane stalled, and they went into a tailspin. And so they train you to go by nothing but the instruments. Don't listen to your feelings. Don't listen to your emotions. Don't listen to any. Just look at the instruments, and you've got to believe those instruments. And if you'll believe those instruments, and they actually train these guys to where you, they take off without being able to see where they're going, and they land without being able to see where they're going. They don't see it. They got to go by the instruments, you know, and, and they find out what the, uh, uh, what height, uh, you know, uh, what height the, the airport's at, the runway's at, and they got to bring it down. And it's so precise. They can bring that plane right down according to the instruments. And of course, uh, when I used to fly over 40 years ago, the instruments are way, way more precise now. We didn't have GPS or nothing. We had a compass and so forth and so on. And so now these guys, they can land precisely without really looking out and seeing what's out in front of them. Well, believe it or not, to make a long story short, that's how God wants us to live. We live by the word. What does the word say? The word says by his stripes you're healed. The word says I can do all things through Christ. The word says God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory. The word says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. The word says call on me and I will answer you. The word says, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yeah, but Pastor Mike, I feel, I understand. I feel, you're, you're still flying by visible flight rules. You, you got you to gotta, you gotta, you up your game here. You got to you learn how to live by faith. You know? and, and now this thing has gone completely wacko. So now we got the convincing little boys that, you're a little girl, and a little boy will never know how a little girl feels. See, and a little girl will never know how a boy feels because uh, the chromosomes are different. Our chromosomes are different. We're created different. So no matter how much they lie to these young people, they twist them all up, they pervert them, they sicken their minds, it, it, they're lying to them, okay? So when we talk about faith, we're not talking about a lie. Because it's the truth. What God's word says is the truth. And I deal with, you can't believe how many people, almost every day uh, I get phone calls. And I don't know why lately, the last four or five phone calls I've had has been people from Georgia. I don't know what in the world is going on in Georgia. And these people aren't even connected to one another, some of them. And they're calling me up. And, and some of them say it's been walking with God for years. But they, they've, all, they've never learned how to really Live by faith. See, they, they, there's faith there. There's faith there. But it's like they're, they're living. They, they, they know what God's word says. They've had miracles. They've seen God answered prayers. But they, they just can't get their eyes off of the symptoms in their body. They, they, they just can't get their eyes off of the problem. And why did Peter sink? Why did Peter sink? And Peter, you know, we just read about grace and peace be multiplied. He should know about it through the knowledge of God and our Savior. So why did Peter sink? Because he got his eyes on the circumstances. It says, and seeing that the wind was strong. Now, wait a minute. He's walking on water, the waves. It's dark. And, and seeing the wind. Well, how did he see the wind? The waves. He got his eyes off of Jesus. Because that's really what faith is, getting your eyes on God. And he began to sink. And he would have drowned. But aren't you glad that God is merciful? And, and so Jesus, he's here to reveal who he is and who the Father is. In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, and he knew the hearts of all men. He already knew. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In the next verse. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, I, I wish we could give this the time it really needs. You know, Brother Hagen used to always preach on Mark 11, 23, 24, 25, all the way down. And people would complain. But the reason why Kenneth Hagen, he would just hammer and hammer and hammer it, because he, he knew that repetition is the key to transformation. What do you mean is the key? I'll give you an example. If it comes to sports, boxing, basketball, 
uh, karate, judo, all, of, all, all, all sports, you train your body to respond without thinking. And so a man who's a good boxer, he so trained himself with his, his, his fist and his foot movements, it just becomes, I'll give you an example. How many of you can walk and still chew gum? Why? Because you trained yourself how to walk. Now, you weren't born in this world walking. You were born in this world just laying there like a, like a slug on the, on the floor, right? So somebody, you had to be taught how to crawl. You had to be taught how to walk. You had to be taught how. To, now, how many of you talk without thinking? Lots of times. How can, now, a very complex language, right? And, and uh, with thousands of words, but you can talk without really thinking. Now, why is that? Because you, you've taught your, you, you, it becomes automatic. It's the same thing. You can live in this realm of faith where it's just automatic. It's natural to believe God. And it should be natural for us to believe God. It should be natural for us to trust God. As a matter of fact, it says, trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy, thy steps. So we should know how to trust God. But Jesus said something that was kind of frightening. He said, when I come back to the earth, will there be any faith left? What, what, what do you mean faith? A faith that believes God. A faith that says, you know what, God, you can't lie. You said it, you declared it, you proclaim it, I'm going to stand on it. You know, God said it, that settles it. I'm going to do it. But so anyways, he says, whom do, because really, all, all of our faith is based on who we think Jesus is. That's really what our faith is built on. It's built on the foundation of Christ Jesus. Who do you think Jesus is? And a lot of Christians have a really twisted ideal of Jesus. As a matter of fact, James knew this. That's why he said, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither he tempted with any man. And what he's saying here is that we've got people thinking that the struggles, the trials, the tests, the problems they're going through is God's fault. He said, no, no, let no man accuse God. He's the, he's the father of lights in whom there's no very minute, not or shadow of turning. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights. But you've got a lot of Christians who will claim what we call the sovereignty of God, or basically they'll teach you that every problem that happens in life is God ordained. No, it's not God ordained. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He said, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Amen? So that's what the devil, but he says, whom do men say that I am? And some said, say, thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. Okay, so, all, so they're listening to the crowds. Okay, the, the disciples are listening to the crowds. They're hearing them talk. Now notice, not one of them they heard talking implied that Jesus was the promised Messiah the Christ, the anointed one. With, with all the signs, all the wonders, all the miracles that were happening, not one of them saw who Jesus was. Why? Because the devil blinded them. Why? Because it says the God of this world blinds the minds and the eyes of them which believe not. They, they, didn't, they, they didn't believe. He, Jesus said this, if the miracles I have done here were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, he said they would have repented a long time ago. So there was such a spirit of unbelief in that day and age. Oh, they were religious. But, you know, some, some, some of the biggest doubters are religious people. I mean, they doubt the Bible. I mean, you think about it, that every born-again believer should be baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Because Jesus gave a commandment. He said, I, 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 he said, I don't want you guys to leave Jerusalem until you be filled with the power from on high, until you be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And we know what happened on the day of Pentecost. Uh, they all spoke in tongues. And yet... The, min just, um, the minority of believers are baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Why? They don't believe it's for today. They don't believe the book. And remember, 
believing is what brings receiving. Believing is what brings receiving. So we don't focus on the manifestation of what we're believing for. We focus on Christ and we believe that we received. We believe that we received and then it will manifest. And it really doesn't matter when it manifests. Uh, I'll give you a story truly happened in Smith Wigglesworth days. There was a woman who came to one of his meetings. This young lady had a big old groiter on her throat. Big, ugly groiter. So Smith said to her, because Smith taught a lot on faith and what it means to believe to receive, and he, he taught, and he said to that woman, he said, now I'm going to lay hands on you. Do you believe that you're going to receive? Yes, I believe the minute you pray for me, I am going to receive. So he laid hands on her. And then she just began to praise God because that's what you do. If, if, for instance, if you needed money tonight and I handed you a hundred dollar bill, if you had any decency, you would say, well, thank you. Thank you for that hundred dollar bill, wouldn't you? You'd say, thank you. Well, if you didn't say thank you, that means you're pretty ungrateful. But you would say, thank you. Okay, so the minute you truly in your heart believe that you receive, guess what you're going to do? Thank you. Thank you. And you're going to keep thanking him. So she went away praising God she was healed. Well, guess what? It was still there in the natural. So all that time for a whole year now, she goes home and said, thank God, Mom, Jesus healed me. That's what she said to mom. She told, I thank God he healed me. And people would say to her, well, you better do something about that. She'd say, thank God I'm healed. That's all. She wouldn't argue with him. Thank God I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. So a whole year goes by. It might even got better, bigger. So she goes back and Brother Smith would give people opportunities to stand up and testify. So this woman with the gorder, she jumps up and she says, praise God, I was here last year. And Brother Smith Wigglesworth laid his hands on me. He cursed his, the goiter, and it's, and it's gone. She said, I am healed in the name of Jesus. Well, now, you'd think the people that were in that meeting would pat her on the back and say, I agree with you. I believe with you. I'm standing with you. Praise God, you're healed. No, they didn't. They attacked her. They criticized her. They mocked her. They made fun of her. So she went back to the hotel room. And she said to the Lord, standing in front of the mirror, there it is. She said, now, Lord, you know that I know in my heart that I'm healed. You know and I know. But these people out here, they don't believe and they don't know it. So, Lord, for their sake, will you let them know it? She woke up the next morning and it was like it had never been there. Yep. See, because she saw herself healed. She saw that gorder gone. So he says, whom do men say that I am? They don't see who he is. And Jesus said, but whom say ye that I am? Whom, whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, now we, I don't know what the, the length of waiting there was, because he says, okay, guys, you've been with me for three and a half years. You've seen me do miracle after miracle. He didn't verbally say this, but it could be said. What do you have to say about who I am? Because that really... It's going to make all the difference. I'm going to preach on this Sunday. Who do you see Jesus as? And Peter, he answered and said, oh, thou art the Christ. You're the promised Messiah. You're the one who was foretold that was going to come and deliver the people of Israel. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus said something to him. He said, you're blessed, Simon. You know why? You're blessed because you see who I am. Notice, your blessings can only be as deep as who you see Jesus is. Your blessings can't be any deeper than that. Now, uh, some people have an advantage if they're raised in a home where their parents know who Jesus is, and they declare it and proclaim it, embrace it, and grab it, okay? But there, there's a, I wasn't raised in a home like that. Now, I did, we as a family, we did, as Catholics, we weren't born again, we did believe Jesus was God himself manifested in the flesh, conceived and given birth to by a virgin, 
who did signs, wonders, and miracles. Catholics have no, at least when Catholicism, when I was in it 50 years ago, we believed in miracles. See, a lot of Protestants don't believe in miracles anymore, but we did believe in miracles. We did believe in the supernatural. We did believe he died on the cross. We, when, when, when Good Friday would come around, we were, we were in mass. Uh, when Christmas came around, we were in midnight mass. Uh, there is no salvation in that. It's just that we did believe. So when, when I was confronted with, with uh, getting my heart right, right with God, because I, uh, I believed in the resurrection, we celebrated Easter. And so I fell to my knees so that knowledge was there, and I embraced it, and it became real to me. And it says, you're blessed, Simon, because you believe. And flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. For in other words, we're talking stuff here that your natural eyes, you can't trust them. You can't believe them. You can't, I don't, I don't trust because a lot of people, and I understand now, so if you're watching this video and I've ministered to you over the phone or by email or by Facebook, I'm not attacking you. You've got to get out of how you feel. Why well, just, I just, uh, I've got all this pain in my body. I understand I've had pain in my body many times. Broken bones, hernias, tumors, uh, terrible symptoms in my body. I don't believe them. I believe God. And guess what? It goes away. The, the symptoms, as I'm standing on the word, and I don't let what my body's telling me to determine what I'm going to do, those symptoms, they'll go away. Matter of fact, it's kind of strange how the devil works, because I woke up, and, you know, I broke my, my uh, right kneecap one time, and I broke my right, right foot. So I'll wake up sometimes, and my kneecap will feel like it's broke again, or my foot will feel like it's broken again. So I'll get up out of bed, and that foot acts like it doesn't want to carry my weight. And I'll say, you lying devil, you lying devil, you lying devil. And I, I don't tell anybody. I'll just go about my day praising God. Well, within two to three hours, guess what? The pain switches from my right knee and my right foot to my left knee and my left foot. Has that ever happened to any of you? That when you were standing on the word, all of a sudden, because he couldn't get you to agree, because if two be not agreed together, they can't walk together. Well, I don't know about you. I don't want to walk with the devil. So I'm not going to agree with what he's saying about my body. So he'll, he'll, he'll attack my left foot, my left ankle, and make me feel like I can't hardly walk on my left ankle. And I laugh at him. I say, you goofball, you dummy. I said, you tried to get me going about my right foot, telling me that, you know, it's all messed up. And because I wouldn't accept it, now you kind of switch the pain over to my left foot. I said, you're a loser. And in a very short time, all that pain would be gone from my left foot. But this happens all the time, whether it be my hips or, or whether it be uh, one side of my body or the other side of the body. I mean, listen, I, I don't talk about all the times the devil attacks my body with symptoms. You know why? Because I don't care what he says. Well, don't you think you ought to go to get a prognosis? No, I'm not going to the medical world. I just wrote a book called I Do Not Need Your Prognosis. <laughs> I don't need it. You know why? Because I've got God's prognosis. Oh, so he said, you're blessed, Simon, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, why would he get this revelation and other people didn't? I'm going to tell you the reason why, because I believe that Peter really wanted to know who Jesus was. You know, you, you can spend a lifetime with a person and never really know who they are. Never find, you might think you know, I know you. Uh -huh. I remember many, many years ago. My wife and I were going through a hard time, and it, a, lot, a lot of it was my fault. And I said something to her, and we've been married for maybe 15 years or something. And she looked at me, and she said, you don't know me. You don't know me. And, and it kind of flabbergasted me. I thought, I don't know you. I've had my kids with you. I've, we've traveled together, but I really didn't know her, see. And so people, and this is where they thought, see, the people who should have known who Jesus was, was his own family. But they didn't know him from iota. Matter of fact, when he started doing the signs and wonders and miracles, they said that he lost his mind and they wanted to lock him up. They didn't know him. And um, so it's, we, 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 we could, 
live around the truth and not know the truth. Because Jesus was the truth. Lived around the truth and didn't know the truth. But Peter, he said, you're blessed. And he says, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Now, some people have you implied that he's talking about Peter. No, he's talking about the revelation that Peter had of who Jesus is. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he says this, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now this, this is amazing, because what he's saying to Peter, Peter, this revelation of who I am is going to give you the power and the authority to bind and to loose going to give you power over the works of the devil because you know who I am see that's why if you know Jesus as your healer and all sickness is of the devil because it says you know of Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil that means every person that Jesus prayed for spoke to healed it was the devil at work in their bodies and Jesus told the devil to let him go. And he had to go. So if you get a revelation of the authority of Christ uh, and who Jesus really is, then you can bind and you can lose. Now, if you look at Jesus when he took authority, now, I, and, and I've never been one to pray long times for people with needs. Uh, but I did, I, I have learned a little bit different because Joanna Hurden will be here this month. And uh, you hear her tell stories where she prayed for some people for a long time. And I understand now it wasn't for her, it was for them. See, she prayed for them and she kept on praying until all of a sudden the person would grab a hold and believe. Smith Wigglesworth talks about some nights he would, he, he would, all night long he'd be in prayer over a person with an incurable disease because he knew that he had to get to that place where faith exploded in his heart and would raise that person up off the bed of death. And I found out that's true with myself. There's times when I've been in certain situations, I just got to go after God and go after God and go after God and go after God until all of a sudden the light of heaven shined on my heart and I knew that I knew that I knew it was done and then it was done. So anyways, I, I just, uh, I'm going to give you some things because the word I am, Jesus, you know, when, when in, in Exodus, he said, go tell him that I am that I am. When they went to deliver the children of Israel out of the hands of, of, of Egypt, he said, tell him I am that I am. And then in the New Testament, over uh, 200 times, it uses the word I am. I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And these are all scriptures. I am the son of God. I am the son of man. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I am the root and offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. I am the king of the Jews. I am the king of kings. I am the Lord of lords. I am the Messiah, the Christ. I am the deliverer. I am the holy one of God. I am the head of the church. I am the judge of the living and the dead. I am the lamb of God. I'm the light of men. I am the word. I am the word that was made flesh. I am the savior of the world. I am the chief cornerstone. I am, I am the image of the invisible God. I am the great high priest. I am the faithful witness. I am the amen and amen. I am the bridegroom. I am the prince of peace. I am the author and finisher of our faith. I am the captain of salvation. I am the horn of salvation. I am the righteous branch. I am the just one. Uh, there's way more than that. Our faith can't be any great, greater than our level of knowing who Jesus really is. And you could memorize all these terms. It's got to be in your heart. You, you, you got to, you know, I think about this scripture. He said, behold, I give unto you power to tread upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means come to harm you. 
Do we believe that? Do, do I believe that? I, I, I choose to believe it. I, I choose to believe that God is my provider. So, Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this word. I thank you for this truth. I pray that you would quicken it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.